Good afternoon. I'd like to welcome you to the Medical Center Hour. This is a program of the Center for Biomedical Ethics and Humanities and Marcia Day Childress from the Center. Um, yesterday was Valentine's Day. Lovers, young and old, celebrated with kisses and flowers and chocolates. And they toasted each other with crystal flutes of champagne, perhaps martinis, maybe with icy tall pilsners, or with stemmed glasses gone ruby red with Pinot Noir. But today, in a program titled Message in a Bottle, a more sober subject, with sober implications for medicine and society, a darker side of alcohol. All of us at UVA certainly know about this, especially given a couple of high-profile courtroom trials in our community in recent years involving excessive alcohol use and fatal physical violence. But this medical center, hour addresses a different aspect of alcohol's dark side, its use by women during pregnancy. A generation has passed since the doctor first noted that women who drank alcohol heavily while pregnant uh, gave birth to underweight infants with some disturbing telltale characteristics. Up until then, no one really worried much about alcohol consumption during pregnancy. Indeed, uh, according to our speaker, alcohol was thought so harmless that doctors sometimes administered it intravenously during labor. But with recognition of what is known as fecal, fetal alcohol syndrome or fetal alcohol spectrum disorder, has come realizations that alcohol has potent teratogenic effects, resulting in significant lifelong physical and neurobehavioral impairments. The other realization was that maternal drinking during pregnancy is a pressing public health concern. For many years now, expectant mothers have been cautioned to moderate their alcohol use, although more recent studies of the risks of fetal alcohol syndrome have health authorities urging complete abstinence. And there was a study really released within the last month or so that said that. We welcome today medical historian Janet Golden, who will chart for us the construction and social history of fetal alcohol syndrome and fetal alcohol spectrum disorder. Professor of History at Rutgers University in Camden, New Jersey, Janet Golden is author of Medicine in a Bottle, Message in a Bottle, The Making of Fetal Alcohol Syndrome, a book that interweaves her particular interests in women's history, history of childhood, and American social history. As she'll tell us, the story of fetal alcohol syndrome is a story much bigger than just mothers and babies in a culture that socializes around generous amounts of alcohol. It involves the courts, the media, the medical establishment, public health policy making, social rituals and their change, and the public imagination. Today's program is one of our History of the Health Sciences lectures made possible through our collaboration with historical collections in the Health Sciences <coughs> Library. So please join me in welcoming Janet Golden, and we'll hear the message in the bottom. Thank you. Thank you. On May 31st, 1977, Americans met Melissa, the first child with fetal alcohol syndrome, and that was the term used for most of the period I'm talking about. The first child with fetal alcohol syndrome, or FAS as I'll call it, to appear on network television news. Dr. Kenneth Lyon-Jones, a professor of pediatrics specializing in genetics and disc morphology, and a co-author of the article in which FAS was first named, described Melissa for viewers as the camera zoomed in on her face, showing Americans what FAS looked like, and telling them as he told them that Melissa was mentally retarded. The very next day, the National Institute on Alcohol Abuse and Alcoholism and the National Council on Alcoholism made an official announcement that women who had more than two drinks a day during pregnancy risked giving birth to damaged babies. Uh, named in 1973, fetal alcohol syndrome is a pattern of birth defects that occurs as a result of heavy maternal alcohol use in pregnancy. It's characterized by abnormal facial features, growth deficiencies, and central nervous system problems. People with the syndrome typically have problems with learning, excuse me, memory, attention span, communication, vision, 
hearing, or a combination of these. And as a result, they have difficulties in school and problems in getting along with others. FAS is a permanent condition affecting every aspect of an individual's life and the lives of his or her family because at its core, FAS and FASD are birth defects of the mind. There we go. Um, studies by the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention find rates of FAS from 0.2 to 1.5 per 1,000 live births, uh, depending on which area of the United States we're looking at. Um, and of course, the condition is found throughout the world. Um, it's important to note that alcohol exposure in utero causes a range of disorders known under the umbrella FASD, of which FAS is the most severe. Uh, FASDs are thought to occur approximately three times as often as FAS, and the statistics on this are always changing. Uh, many experts believe that alcohol is the most common cause of mental retardation, alcohol exposure at birth, that is, the most common cause of mental retardation in the United States, and alcohol exposure at birth may be responsible for up to 5% of all congenital abnormalities. Now, since it first was named in 1973, FAS has appeared in many guises. It began as a medical discovery. It became a public health problem. <clears throat> it was transformed under media scrutiny into a social deformity that expressed the moral failings of mothers and marked their children as politically marginal and potentially dangerous. And then for a time it faded from view, even as the numbers of individuals diagnosed with the condition continued to grow. So today I want to present a cultural biography of FAS in the late 20th century, and then address some of the issues I've come to face since the publication of my book. So, so let's start with what I call phase one, discovering the offspring of alcohol in women. As I said earlier, the term FAS first appeared in a 1973 article in The Lancet by Kenneth Lyon Jones and David W. Smith. It followed an earlier publication from them and two others in their Seattle research team that described the shared anomalies of eight unrelated children whose mothers were chronic alcoholics. Further research and surveys of the historical medical literature found a French medical journal article that described 127 children <coughs> born to alcoholic women, and this helped confirm the argument that alcohol was a teratogen, a substance that caused structural, congenital, functional, pathological changes during embryonic and fetal development. <coughs> Excuse me. Now, for scientists, this finding <coughs> raised many questions. Did the timing of exposure matter? Were there cofactors such as malnutrition or vitamin deficiencies that strengthened the effects of the alcohol exposure? Um, for clinicians and the public, however, there are only two critical questions. Should pregnant or could pregnant women drink? And if so, how much could they safely drink? Now clearly generations of healthy children have been born after exposure up to alcohol in utero. So the question began, was this a condition only found in the offspring of severely alcoholic women? Or was there some risk at lower levels of consumption? Uh, this was a particularly potent question in the 1970s because there were a growing number of women who were drinking and a growing number with alcohol-related problems. So it had some urgency at the time it was discovered. Um, there was enhanced visibility of female alcoholism. There was concern, widespread concern about its increasing prevalence. And there was more government attention to women's alcohol-related problems. Uh, and this is due, I think, to the feminist health movement. And it forced the secretary of what was in the 1970s known as the Department of Health, Education, and Welfare to order the National Institutes on Alcohol Abuse and Alcoholism to give special consideration to the problems of women. And then Congress passed legislation requiring states to provide alcoholism prevention and treatment programs for women. Now stop and think about that. 
requiring states to provide treatment for women. I guess they never thought of that before. <laughs> it's critical to note that as the public learned about FAS, it did so and interpreted this discovery within a framework of explanation that derived from some immediate earlier encounters with teratogens, particularly thalidomide, rubella, and nicotine. In the early 1960s, images of mostly foreign-born children with missing or shortened limbs as a result of uh, prenatal exposure to the sleeping aid thalidomide was flashed across the nation's TV screens and appeared in weekly news magazines and daily uh, newspaper accounts. And President Kennedy issued a warning to women who'd been given thalidomide in the Merrill Dow test. Uh, shortly after that, there was a thalidomide, uh, excuse me, a rubella epidemic in the United States that resulted in the birth of approximately 20,000 infants with rubella syndrome, many of them deaf, blind, microcephalic, or otherwise severely mentally retarded. Uh, later, of course, the public would learn, and if you smoke, you have seen this, uh, that cigarette smoking by pregnant women resulted in lower birth weights and higher perinatal mortality. So these encounters with teratogens had prepared the public to understand the potential ramifications of alcohol abuse in pregnancy. And um, it also paved the way for expanded access to legal abortion in the 1960s and 1970s as a therapeutic option. This was closely tied to the rubella epidemic. So after the first report by Smith, Jones, and their colleagues on malformations among the offspring of chronic alcoholic women appeared, uh, just six months after the Roe v. Wade ruling, uh, abortion was soon proposed as a solution. In August of 1974, The Lancet published an article from an uh, American physician uh, that said, quote, would Dr. Jones and his associates tell us specifically if they now recommend abortion of severe chronically alcoholic pregnant women? And the doctors replied that the risk of adverse outcome was of sufficient magnitude to, quote, merit serious consideration of early termination of pregnancy by such women. Time Magazine reported that uh, doctors were warning prospective mothers to stop drinking heavily and, quote, to consider having abortions if they came, became pregnant while well addicted to alcohol. And on the ABC Evening News, anchor Barbara Walters made the same observation. However, as political opposition to abortion mounted, physicians, as well as news anchors and news magazines, became more reticent about discussing the topic and eventually fell silent. So, to sum up that very first phase, within a relatively short time, FAS is transformed from a medical discovery to a medical problem facing severe alcoholic women. It then has a medical solution, encouraging alcoholic women to either avoid pregnancy or to have an abortion. But as abortion became politically contested, <clears throat> And as new data suggested risks to fetuses occurred at lower levels of exposure than first thought, FAS shifted from being a medical problem to a public health matter best managed by warning all women to cease drinking during pregnancy. So we get to phase two, the crusade to warn. What's ironic here is that it is scientific uncertainty that propels the movement to advise pregnant women not to drink. Neither clinicians nor uh, scientists could determine a level below which alcohol caused no harm, because each individual fetus varies in its genetic susceptibility to alcohol. That's a core principle of teratology. So despite the paucity of epide epidemiological evidence indicating that low to moderate um, which sort of said low to moderate use cause no damage, uh, an emerging cadre of experts said no consumption could be considered safe. So now we have a population of women at risk that expands from those who drink heavily in pregnancy to all women who might have taken a drink at any time during pregnancy. And we get that first warning from the National Institute on Alcohol Abuse and Alcoholism in 1977. A portion of it notes as you read, the pregnant woman who has six or more drinks a day, 
Upwards of three ounces of alcohol runs a significant risk of proving, producing a child with birth defects. At the time, the evidence suggested that FAS actually occurred among women whose alcohol intake amounted to eight or 10 drinks or more per day. Um, but at a closed meeting of the NIAAA, they came up with the six drink uh, decision. And I described that, how they got there in my book. So we have an official warning. And then we have a crusade to warn. It's a righteous cause. It's suffused with chivalry and emotional fervor. And it's protected, aimed at protecting what some people call the unborn. FDA Commissioner Donald Kelly then wrote to the Department of, of Treasury's Bureau of Alcohol, Tobacco, and Firearms to ask if they would consider placing warning labels on alcoholic beverages. Uh, subsequently, Senator Strom Thurmond moved to take the matter out of the hands of the BATF and introduced legislation calling for warning labels, something he'd been doing since 1967. So now we've got the government officials assuming the mantle of the crusading knights, and of course the alcoholic beverage manufacturers are going to step into the role of infidels. They are under siege but they are well equipped and they fight back with very successful lobbying efforts that will keep labels off the bottles for 11 years. They convince their allies in the BATF to support educational efforts rather than regulatory measures and they formed alliances with key senators. So what do these rebuffed public health officials do to reach consumers? In 1981, Surgeon General Edward Brandt issued a cautionary warning uh, to avoid all alcohol. The following year, a Senate subcommittee held hearings on alcoholism and drug abuse in which Brandt testified that fetal alcohol syndrome could be associated with occasional or social drinkers. Um, now, helping to propel public interest were the costs of FAS, largely for lifetime institutional care for the severely retarded. Uh, and of course, the belief that public health education often offered a thrifty means of averting what many had come to call a preventable tragedy. Now, Congress is busy debating but failing to enact labeling legislation. State and local governments, as well as the NIAAA, are enlisting in the crusade to warn. Uh, some locales start mandating warning labels in bars and liquor stores. I don't know if that occurs here. I'll have to visit bars and liquor stores and find <laughs> out. Um, and FAS became a mandated part of high school uh, health education programs. I know that many of you younger folks have probably learned about it in high school. Um, and uh, the media is cooperating in this endeavor. We get television news segments about alcohol research and about women, and we, the new segments often end with a reminder that alcohol could cause birth defects. Women's magazines broadcast the same message, and the BATF, in conjunction with the NIAAA, then distributed an informational pamphlet featuring America's favorite doctor. I'll give you a minute to figure out who that is, and then I'll show you. And you'll show your age but through your recognition. <laughs> yes, Rex Morgan. Uh, Rex Morgan was uh, written by a psychiatrist, Dr. Nicholas Dallas. Um, so, to sum up phase two then, we have, uh, by the late 1970s, the specter of alcohol use rather than abuse hanging over America's pregnant women, uh, and the message is being received. A lot of women halt their drinking during pregnancy. And yet, as the data indicates, if there's a troubling sign. Those born with alcohol-related birth defects, their numbers are climbing. Um, we don't know whether it's better attention to the problem, better diagnosis, um, but it suggests that this public health message is not sufficient. So we get to phase three, what I call the discourse of law and responsibility. The public health crusade succeeded in making drinking during pregnancy deviant behavior, but it could not contain the definition within a medical framework because there were ongoing political debates about addiction and fetal rights, and that spurred the transformation of FAS from kind of an individual 
tragedy into evidence of willful misconduct by women. So the emphasis is going to move out of the congressional hearing rooms and the public health agencies and into the jails and courtrooms. And this era begins just as public health activists finally succeed in getting their, their warning label on the bottle. It comes out, and then Richard Narkowitz, president of the American Academy of Pediatrics, says, quote, alcohol problems are rampant in America today, and our innocent children are paying the price. By using the language of innocence, which was simultaneously being deployed to win assistance for children who are HIV positive or cocaine exposed, Narkowitz left unspoken its corollary the need to find and punish the guilty. Now the very first to be targeted were, <clears throat> excuse me, alcoholic beverage manufacturers. <clears throat> excuse me. By tradition, tort law protected them from the duty to warn because it was assumed that drunkenness was a known outcome of drinking. However, there were several cases in the 1980s that breached this defense and opened the door to lawsuits brought by the parents of children with FAS. And in 1989, in one case, Thorpe v. James B. Beam Distilling Company, that case makes it to trial. The jury ultimately ruled not on the question of whether the plaintiff, Michael Thorpe, had been damaged by his mother's drinking, but on Mrs. Thorpe's behavior. Newspapers covering the trial revealed unflattering details about her history that emerged during cross-examination, including the fact that she drank a fifth of Jim Beam a day while pregnant, and that she'd been told to stop drinking by physicians, uh, members of her family, and during inpatient treatment for alcoholism. Now, Jim Beam had a little problem as well. It had to walk a very fine line. Under no circumstances could it admit that drinking during pregnancy could cause birth defects, but it needed to make jurors believe that there was sufficient public knowledge of the risks of drinking during pregnancy for Mrs. Thorpe to have known not to indulge. After four days of deliberation, the jury found for Jim Beam. Post-trial interviews with jurors revealed that they did not find medical experts' descriptions of fetal alcohol syndrome entirely credi credible. Despite hearing from some of the leading American FAS experts, they concluded that Michael Thorpe's problem stemmed from his home environment, hardly, finding it very hard to draw a line between congenital problems and the situation in which he lived. Shortly after that case ended, Michael Doris published The Broken Cord, a prize-winning account of the life of his adopted son with fetal alcohol syndrome. The book and the ABC movie adaptation did quite a bit to publicize FAS within the Native American community. It also helped many parents realize what was, quote, wrong with their children. Yet, Doris's work ultimately argued for blaming and even incarcerating mothers. Although Doris campaigned for labeling laws and expanded alcohol education, and argued that liquor companies had, quote, a moral responsibility to fund FAS research. He also supported pregnancy policing, using in his book and in interviews about the advantages of jailing pregnant women, a policy that he reported some tribal groups had already chosen. Now, data from the Centers for Disease Control indicated that FAS indeed took a terrible toll in Native American communities ravaged by alcohol. From 1981 to 1986, the incidence among whites, this is a CDC term, was 0.9 per 10,000 births, among blacks, 6 per 10,000 births, and among American Indians, 29.9 per 10,000 births. Avoiding the questions about the underlying causes of alcohol abuse in particular communities, and issues such as poverty and access to health resources, the findings led to FAS being characterized as, quote, an Indian problem. Uh, NBC then broadcast a week-long special report called Tragedy of Pine Ridge that included a scene with a pregnant Native, Native American woman drinking beers and a doctor who says on camera, quote, 
Women who can't control their drinking during pregnancy should have protective custody during the pregnancy for nine months. Think about that for a moment. Despite successful efforts by the American Medical Association, the American Psychiatric Association, the American Hospital Association, and others to encourage public understanding of alcoholism as a disease, for alcoholic pregnant women, it was a personal failing and possibly a criminal act. Propelling this interpretation uh, was the eruption of a moral panic over crack cocaine use. The tidal wave of crack mother and crack baby stories flooding the media and ongoing legal efforts uh, to, to grant legal rights to fetuses by anti-choice activists had a profound, under, uh, sort of altered the understanding of FAS and, and made it seem as prenatal child abuse. Um, so we get crack as the African American problem, we get alcohol and FAS is the, the excuse me, crack is the African American problem, FAS is the Native American problem, and then we start getting newspaper stories about arrests of pregnant women who are charged with the felony of drinking while pregnant. Uh, there was one case in Wyoming where a woman sought admission to the hospital after being battered by her husband. And while there, her blood alcohol level was measured. And according to some accounts, she did have a child with FAS. Uh, so she was arrested for drinking while pregnant, although that was dismissed. Now I should note right away that there's uh, significant evidence that a greater number of fetuses are at risk from battering by male partners of pregnant women than from alcohol. Two years later, the CBS Evening News detailed the arrest of a Nebraska woman on charges of binge drinking while pregnant and felony child abuse. She had already given birth to two children diagnosed with FAS. And then they started arresting people for delivering a substance uh, through the umbilical cord. Now, the AMA had to step in because it threatened medical autonomy as well as the rights of individual women. In 1990, its Board of Trustees uh, issued this statement saying that doctors should not have a legal duty to seek court-ordered obstetrical intervention. And incarceration for the purpose of preserving fetal health uh, would likely prove counterproductive, scaring women away from needed medical treatment. And the AMA report notes that prisons are ill-equipped to deal with the needs of pregnant inmates. Nevertheless, it, it sort of left room for action, saying in an exceptional circumstance there could be action. But clearly the idea is to indemnify doctors who fail to report pregnant women to the authorities. So the AMA has stepped in. Uh, and now we come to the end of phase three, where we've sort of reached a crescendo with the finding in the James uh, B. Beam case, with the uh, legal cases, with the AMA decision. And that brings us to phase four. In 1989, and I'll let you read this one, Washington Post conservative columnist and physician Charles Krauthammer described the threat of a bio-underclass, a generation of physically damaged cocaine babies whose biological inferiority is stamped at birth. Uh, echoing the uh, early 20th century advocates of colonies for the unfit, Krauthammer proposed colonies for substance abusing mothers. Now, alcoholic women are not swept up in this particular rhetorical whirlwind, but they're beginning to be understood and stigmatized in similar ways, and soon there were their offspring. This is because we begin to get what I call the adoption nightmare stories that end with lawsuits against agencies that hid information about adoptees. A 1994 story in a Washington State newspaper told the story of a violent child whose adoptive parents were suing the state agency that placed their boy in their family, suing for fraud because it would withheld information about his status. Their attorney had already won earlier multi-million dollar victory for one couple and had 10 other cases in the pipeline. So we get accounts of toxic children, virulent carriers, of the social pathologies of their mothers. Um, importantly, nobody is discussing um, the successful efforts of adoptive parents uh, to 
organize and find services for their children and to get help for their children. Now these adoption stories are kind of the prelude. The finale is played out on death row. In this setting, claims of convicted criminals that they suffered from FAS, often presented as extenuating circumstances at the time of sentencing or in clemency appeals, uh, are looked upon with suspicion. Political leaders, judges, law enforcement officials recast FAS one final time from a con congenital condition to, quote, a devil made me do it defense, cynically employed by hardened criminals seeking to escape the consequences of their actions. In 1992, 15 years after Kenneth Lyon Jones ap appeared on television to introduce Melissa, he is on Nightline with Ted Koppel. The show opens with a teaser about an argument that goes back to the womb and offers a portrait of a killer who was, quote, brain damaged as a fetus, abused as a child. And we get a clip of Jones taken from a clemency video sent to California Governor Pete Wilson on behalf of convicted double murderer Robert Walton Harris. Jones is heard to say his mother was a chronic alcoholic. Now, Jones and other experts failed to convince the governor to halt the execution. Uh, Wilson said uh, he deplored prenatal alcohol abuse but called for, quote, the exercise of personal responsibility by those capable of exercising it, uh, seeming to say that Harris, despite being damaged by FAS, uh, could understand the consequences of his actions. He died in the gas chamber on April 21st. 1992, the first individual executed in California since 1967. Since then, there have been many cases uh, with appeals based on FAS. Um, one attorney, a defense attorney, said, I really like the argument philosophically because it makes the defendant totally blameless. It's a terrific question. How could anyone on a death penalty jury hold a person responsible for something that happened before birth? But in most cases, that's what they did. Here in Virginia in 1990, convicted murderer Richard Boggs was executed despite evidence he suffered from brain damage because of FAS. Um, there are others. They appeared on 2020 on other television shows. Um, and you see people looking at uh, one with Charles Gaston. Somebody looks at his baby picture and said, if you look at the baby picture, you go, well, that's fetal alcohol syndrome. Uh, in 1997, Texas executed Terry Washington, a convicted murderer who was mentally retarded as a result of FAS. Now we know in the Atkins decision that we're no longer executing people who are retarded. Uh, if you go ahead and Google FAS and death row, you can just find all the latest stories. So the Harris case made a, a crucial impact on the FAS story. Uh, to some, it was just a last-ditch diagnosis, and, you know, the try anything, blame mom. Um, and it, it was a, a pretty ugly story of his, uh, his crimes. I'm not defending him there. But I, what I want to point to is how an article that began with, uh, that started a, a worldwide scientific enterprise uh, supplied the momentum for local action uh, a crusade to warn women, public health efforts, uh, a label on an alcoholic uh, beverage ends up with, in fact, public sympathy for the victims of people harmed by individuals with FAS and public scorn for their mothers and fear of those who were diagnosed with the, the problem. So let me get to phase five, what I call my imagined response. When I wrote my book, back in the uh, aught years, I made a deliberate decision not to interview individuals with FASD or their family members. Although, and I, I know this sounds pretty lame, I did watch a number of television and video clips containing interviews with them. Uh, but my interest was in the intellectual project of disease or syndrome biography. And my, my emphasis was on the cultural representations and issues of medicalization and demedicalization. However, once my book appeared and I began to give talks, I found myself meeting 
uh, and hearing from parents of individuals with FASD uh, and with those in, who worked in various settings with FASD. Uh, one week, for example, I got this email. Hi, Dr. Golden. I'm the mother of an adopted daughter who's now 29 years old and in prison. We adopted her at birth and have run the travesties through the years due to FAS. I have written a book combining the experiences and tangential information about FASD. Each chapter begins with appropriate song lyrics. Any chance you could look at expert excerpts included in the attachment. So I, I guess I gave myself a new job by writing that book. And as a result, I felt to con compelled to address the question I tried so eagerly to avoid, what do I think should be done? Uh, I ended up writing some editorials, and now I end my talks by giving an answer. I begin by noting there's evidence about the effectiveness of relatively low-cost intervention programs for pregnant alcohol-abusing women, and that despite the fact that they're relatively low-cost, funds for these programs are not readily available. But I want to address alcohol abuse more generally and say that the constant reframing of FAS and its debates over its meaning have caused us to lose sight of the alcohol abusing woman or women who lost their health and often their lives to alcohol. Studies of alcoholic women giving birth to alcohol affected babies revealed again and again a shockingly high mortality rate. A physician running an FAS clinic in Seattle estimated that 75% of the mothers of his patients were missing or dead within five years of giving birth. A report on Native American children with FAS published in 2000 found a maternal mortality rate of 23.1%. And a very admittedly small study by, in Germany found that 11 of 60 mothers of children with FAS, 18.3%, had died by a 10-year follow-up. Now, in addition to the excess mortality, these women, like other alcohol abusers, suffered from terrible physical and psychological disorders linked to their drinking. And their deaths and their suffering went largely unnoticed in this debate. So that ideas about remedying FAS remain rooted in easy fixes, such as warning labels, or unfunded programs, or high school health classes. Um, uh, alcohol abusing women, I want to go on and say, have numerous barriers to treatment. Most importantly, the absence of uh, the ability to take their children into care with them when they receive inpatient care. Um, they're not going to go into treatment unless they can be assured of regaining custody of their children or remaining with their children. And oftentimes family members are opposed to them entering children because these women, however incapacitated, are needed to care for other children. So here are the hard questions I would pose. How can women be provided with inpatient substance abuse treatment that does not threaten them with the loss of their children? Can we offer parity with other illnesses for health care coverage for substance abuse and mental health services? Even in, when we require insurance companies to offer chemical dependency benefits to their large purchasers, the rules do not always specify a specific level of coverage, making inpatient care unavoidable, avoid, unavailable or of limited duration. And of course, who will pay for this treatment? Most states have extremely limited Medicaid programs for chemical dependency. And what about people who lack coverage? And this includes, I will add, uh, uh, eight non-legal immigrants. They're still here. They still sometimes drink. They still need care. They are not covered. Um, and how do we educate the public that substance abuse is not an ailment for which there is a cure and that people will relapse and need continuing services. So, to conclude, over the past 30 years or so, fetal alcohol syndrome and fetal alcohol spectrum disorder have had many meanings. A medical discovery, a public health problem, a political topic, a media phenomenon, a morality tale about motherhood, and a legal claim. 
Its medical definition has grown more precise as scientific research has elucidated precisely how alcohol affects the developing brain. Now we need a new social definition. FAS is a birth defect and equally important, it is an indication that alcohol abusing women are not getting the help they need. These women don't need warnings, they need treatment. If we provide it, we can prevent their deaths and the births of babies with FASD. Thank you. Thank you. Um, we have a generous amount of time for some questions, comments, and I discussion. always get a lot of questions, and I'm not a doctor, so I can't answer those. So I have a mic that I'll bring to you for, um, for your comments and questions. While people are thinking and mulling over what's a lot of oh, she's got helpful it. and good information, um, would you please identify yourself? Yep. My name is Ann Linden, and I run a not-for-profit organization called Ukraine Works Limited, and we're working on FASD prevention in Ukraine. Um, as a matter of fact, it was very interesting to see the picture of a book, um, Jody Liss and Jody Culp's book because we just translated that into Ukrainian and into Russian, and it's on our website. Um, what, I don't have any contacts here in this community that deal with FASD. And so if anyone here is, deals with FASD, I would really like to know about the person, because I really need to develop local contacts. Thank you. Thanks. Um, and I noticed um, you have a list of references uh, in your handout. One of the uh, references was a recent article in the New York Times magazine um, about an adopted child um, with uncontrollable rages um, who has um, fetal alcohol syndrome and um, the article is actually about the boy and the service dog uh, that the family has, um, has acquired um, that is working most effectively with the child. Um, but I wondered, you listed that on your, on your references. Did. Would you like to make any comments about that piece? Well, I, I encourage everybody to read that because although it's not the focus of the article, which is the service dog, it makes very clear something that people need to understand, which is that, as I said earlier, um, fetal alcohol syndrome, fetal alcohol spectrum disorder lead to birth defects of the mind. They're not visible. We can see the physical effects of congenital rubella. We see the physical effects of thalidomide. When FAS came along, people looked at that FAS face and said, oh, it causes physical deformities and really overlooked the significant brain damage that it causes and the sort of problems of daily existence that it causes for individuals. So the article makes clear what an individual deals with, in this case the young boy in the article, and what the family deals with, and really the lack of effective uh, solutions and interventions. People turn to physicians for help, uh, but by then there's not much that they can do. I'll just add for the physicians in the crowd, it was interesting when it was first discovered, um, the pediatricians all said, oh, we can't do anything. Blame the obstetricians for not doing their jobs. And the obstetricians were, who didn't want to deal with this were all saying, you know what, uh, uh, we don't know anything about these kids, we'll have to let the pediatricians take care of that. Um, and then it was discovered that many um, uh, uh, obstetricians really had to be trained, and they do get training now to ask questions about alcohol consumption in pregnancy because many of the older physicians have been trained to deliver alcohol to prevent premature labor and premature delivery. So it was a, they had to do a 180 on that and there's, there's been a generational change in obstetrics training. Yeah. Uh, hi, I'm Roberta Culbertson, I'm a chaplain here, and I would be interested in what you might have to say about the role of religious organizations in this whole movement, in this whole uh, you know, sequence that you laid out for us, because it would seem to me there would be some role for that. Um, those folks in this whole process? I would, I would say, I, and I will confess, I didn't look closely into that. Um, a number of religious people have been involved, of course, in fighting the death penalty and in helping people make these clemency appeals. 
Uh, that's one area. And of course, in counseling individual families. There were also religious organizations who were involved in overseas adoptions who had to very quickly step up and get involved in screening uh, for fetal alcohol effects if it could be measured in terms of uh, the facial impact. But I'm afraid I don't know more than that. doing a lot of running. <laughs> Hi, my name is Anna Resso and I'm a fourth year student here at the University of Virginia. And um, I'm taking a class called Global Culture and Public Health. And our teacher wanted us to organize a local event where we addressed um, issues that we decided on in class. And the two issues that we decided on were um, HIV and AIDS. Um, specifically the prevention of mother-to-child transmission and fetal alcohol syndrome. And um, we're framing the event as like, whose responsibility is it um, to prevent these illnesses or these diseases from happening? And I was wondering what you think about that. Whose responsibility is it? Oh, I would say it's everybody's responsibility. <laughs> the easy answer, right? Um, I think that's a wonderful project you're taking on, and I very much applaud you for that. I think reaching, finding, I think you'll find something that's very uh, challenging, and that is it's actually quite easy to get middle class pregnant women, educated women who are not uh, chronic alcohol abusers, to stop drinking while pregnant, and that the, the rates in that population is going way down, and then sometimes people get letters like, oh my gosh, I didn't know I was pregnant, I had some rum raisin ice cream, you know, is my, do I need to have an abortion, is my baby going to be okay? So you have to almost calm down those folks. Um, what's most needed, I would say, in any community is to find out how many beds there are, inpatient beds, for pregnant substance abusers. Many of them will take people who are um, uh, using uh, injectable drugs because there are ways to safely get them off those drugs through pregnancy. They don't like to take alcohol abusing pregnant women because there's no way to intervene and there's some risks of going through withdrawal. So I would say it would be useful for people to know where is their inpatient treatment that might be available or supports uh, so that if they have family members or friends who they think need help they can talk to them about where to go and uh, I think that would that would be quite useful but you will find it's very difficult to locate inpatient care you might also I don't know anything about Virginia uh, and how Medicaid policies cover uh, chemical dependency but it's probably worth doing a little investigating before you go out there Hi there, uh, my name is Kurt Hobson, I'm a visiting scholar here at the University. Um, I just have a question uh, with regards to you speaking about how uh, women might need to keep custody of the child and that needs to be encouraged. Do you not think perhaps um, a case might be made for saying in some circumstances the child might be seen as vulnerable and that we should maybe put them at the center of the decision making with regards to this? Oh absolutely there are, situa absolutely there are situations where child protective services or Department of Youth and Family Services step in and, because the mother is not able to take care of the child. But you do find there are situations in which um, there, there's binge drinking going on at times, the child's with other family members not at any risk and it's very hard to get the mother to put her family into treatment or to go into treatment unless she knows if I if I clean up if I get sober I'll get my children back or let me take the child with me very young infant and it, it will be monitored and cared for but absolutely there are there are those situations in many of the cases I'm talking about I want to make clear that what happens is a an alcoholic, severely alcoholic pregnant women uh, come to the hospital to deliver. They've never been seen for any prenatal care. Um, and uh, uh, people, nurses will say that they can smell the alcohol in the, the, on the fetus. Um, so these are people at the far end of the spectrum. Most people with full-blown fetal alcohol syndrome have about drink an average of 14 units a day. So 
what that suggests is these are people who have, been, have a long drinking career and have built up the tolerance for that and can get their blood alcohol level to a, a level that ordinary people could not reach. You, you need a drinking career to do that. So in those cases, of course, uh, that's a situation where children would be removed. But in other cases, there is a, a growing binge drinking problem of you know, five or six units at a time, and, and it gets into difficult cases. And of course, there's always the question of how effective uh, uh, the DIFAS or the Department of Family and Youth Services is. So yes, thank you for that question and correction. Uh, Bob Chevalier in Pediatrics. Uh, your story starts in 1973 with the, the Smith and Jones paper. Are there any data looking at the extrapolation of this back earlier? For example, there's the, the Calicac family book that was published right. before 1920. Richard Carp, right. And now the, the revisionist uh, view is right. that a lot of those kids had fetal alcohol right. syndrome rather than inherited uh, feeble-mindedness, as it was called at the time. Right. Uh, and, and that was all caught up in the whole eugenics movement and all. Then there was the, the temperance movement, which might have had an impact on this too. Has anyone gone back and looked at what happened in the first half of the century? Yeah, well I will say thank you for mentioning Dr. Carp's work. He has been in touch with me and we've looked at those Calicac uh, pictures together and the violence studies. Um, I, I don't want to be a self-promoter, but there's a, an article uh, in uh, the International Journal of Epidemiology that, that I made a comment on and some others, uh, Ron Carp as well. Uh, there was a study I think I have the date right, in 1905 in England, a prison physician, Dr. William C. Sullivan, a neurologist and prison physician, noted that when alcoholic, severely alcoholic women were imprisoned, they had healthier babies than when they were out of prison. These were women who cycled in and out of the prison system. And then he did a study comparing the offspring of these women to their sober sisters and got quite good data around the turn of the century. Um, so I would say that's our, our first major study. And then there's quite a bit of, in the French literature pointing this out uh, in terms of uh, the French constant concern about their declining birth rate as the Germans are growing ever bigger and more threatening. So there's quite an extensive literature there. And then when the first studies come out in the US, uh, people go back and mine what had been a huge data set collected in the United States to look for the causes of cerebral palsy. Uh, and they followed uh, women through their pregnancies and the births to see if they could pinpoint a cause. Well, they went back and scanned those records. I think the study started in the late 50s, early 60s, and found the women whose charts stood out by saying these are severe chronic alcoholics and then went and looked at their children and again found the data there. So a lot of cases it was a, a matter of looking backwards, going to the records of uh, institutions for the mentally retarded and pulling records on the mothers. So it was very, quite easy to verify the finding and find these earlier studies. Before that what happened is studies, uh, there was a lot of literature said that children born to alcoholic parents had a problem. They weren't sure whether it was the mother or father. Often alcoholic women live with alcoholic spouses. And there was great concern about what was then called male inebriety. How do we control men's drinking? How do we get them to stop drinking up the family paycheck? Uh, so the problems of women, uh, there was not a lot of attention paid to that. At the end of Prohibition, at, uh, uh, at the Alcohol Yale Studies Center, uh, they made quite a concerted effort to say the problem is the drinker, not the drink. So while they had, they would find this data that would show uh, that the children of alcoholic mothers who were then adopted have had problems, um, but they would turn around and say, well, it, it must have been the home in which they were raised. I mean, they had all the data in front of them. They wanted to reach a different conclusion, and they did. So that's all in my book. <laughs> and it is there. Thank you. Hold on, I'm coming to you. This is like Stairmaster. <laughs> <laughs> Comes the microphone. Thank you. Uh, I understand the impact of hereditary um, influences on individuals who drink or use drugs, but also uh, feel that we, we live in an um, era of violence. And 
I've worked with many women, <clears throat> and I know that for girls, you know, one in four girls are sexually, sexually abused before the age of 18, and trauma plays a great part in people using something to medicate themselves when they're dealing with a traumatic situation like being sexually abused or being in a home where there's um, constant violence, and so they use those type of things. And I work with women in um, corrections, and currently I work in OBGYN clinic, and I see a lot of women who come through or you either being physically abused or either have um, sexual abuse in their history, and so they use that, they medicate themselves because they go with what they know, and that's normally what most people do. So it's like, you know, the schools being aware when um, they are working with kids and churches and just everybody who have contact with, uh, you know, women and kids, the pediatricians as well when they're you know, assessing the child to sort of uh, check into how the child and the mom are relating and the possibility of uh, some type of abuse going on to be able to intervene. But this, the saddest part is that there are a lot of people with those type of issues, but not the services to treat them, so it just continues to be a vicious cycle. Well, I agree with everything you say. Wouldn't it, wouldn't, be, wouldn't it be nice to live in a world where we could access the support services those individuals need and where we had things like universal access to prenatal and maternity care? Um, I wish I could do something about that, but I think you make an important point about uh, substance abuse has its roots in, in problems in, in childhood and in the home. Somebody else? Yeah. Thanks. Hi, I'm Celeste. I'm a graduate student in the poetry program um, at UVA. I was curious about the um, the Surgeon General's warning on the alcohol bottles. There's a second clause about operating machinery in cars. I'm curious if that came in at the same time as the pregnancy clause, and if not, if that was harder or easier to pass. You're talking about the alcoholic beverage warning label? Yes. Yes. Um, it came in at the same time. There's a long uh, history of how that label got on the bottle. The alcoholic beverage industry fought it for years. And then there was a case no, known as the Chipolone case about uh, tobacco exposure, in which the Supreme Court ruled that because tobacco products have warning labels, the cases were not to be tried in state court, but it moved it to the federal level. At that point, the alcoholic beverage industry said, oh, well, if we get a warning label, then we can avoid all these state court trials. So they kind of surrendered. And the debate for them was then about how large the typeface would be and whether it would be on the front or the back of the bottle. Um, and they, the interesting thing about the machinery warning is, of course, many more people uh, are killed by drunk driving or killed by accidents while smoking than are harmed by alcohol abuse in pregnancy. Uh, so they put the least harmful one up front and kind of aimed it at women. Um, you know, it's like, oh, you start reading the label, oh, this is about pregnant women, it's fine for me to drink. Or I guess that's what they, they thought. And so that's, that's how that label got on the bottle. But it was, uh, as soon as the Chipolone ca case came out of the Supreme Court, the alcohol beverage industry withdrew all its opposition, and that label came quite quickly. Uh, as part of the deal with that, you'll notice that alcohol that's advertised on television does not have, a war have any warning with it. And that's because the alcoholic beverage industry said, if you make us put this on televised advertising, we will no longer, in effect, underwrite sports on television. And uh, that was very powerful. Nobody, nobody wants to give up football for a warning label, so that's why we don't see it on television. We're going to have to give up now okay. at the end of an hour. Um, but uh, in Thank terms you. of uh, choosing a typeface, I'd go for a pretty big one in saying this was a <laughs> wonderful and informative and um, and provocative discussion uh, with you. Janet Golden. We hope that you can be with us next week. We have our annual Richardson Lecture that deals with the, also a rather sober subject, medical error and patient safety. The program is called Good Intentions, dot, dot, dot. 
Uh, we have Jenny Strauss-Clay, faculty member in the Department of Classics, and Danny Becker from the Department of Medicine and the Center for Biomedical Ethics and Humanities as our speakers. We hope you can join us uh, next week, and now please thank Janet Golden thank for the message.